Good afternoon, everybody. My name's Norm White with TLV here in Charlotte, North Carolina. I wanna welcome you to the next installment of our webinar series. Today's topic is tracing the causes of heat maintenance issues. We're gonna discuss thermal maintenance and steam heat tracing. Uh, this presentation is based off an article and presentation materials developed by our president, Mr. James Risco with an article that was published in the December 2019 edition of Chemical Engineering Progress. So I wanna thank Jim for his hard work and contribution to uh, package and provide all the materials that we're gonna review here today. Before we get started, I also wanna introduce my fellow TLV uh, STEAM loving collaborators and colleagues. They're gonna be working together with me here behind the scenes today to help support today's program. So if you'd all please turn on your webcams. So first, I'd like to introduce our TLV Corporation President, Mr. Jim Risco. Hi, everyone. Next, I'd like to introduce our Business Development Manager, John Walter. Hello, everybody. Our Manager of Consulting and Engineering Services, Andrew Moore. And last but not least, the Manager of our Design and Engineering Department, Mr. Justin McFarland. Hello. We're going to go ahead and get started. I and my uh, fellow collaborators here are going to turn off our webcams and we'll get started with today's presentation. So before we get started, we do have a little disclaimer here. Uh, all the things that we're going to talk about today uh, are based off of our experience, things, applications we reviewed in the field, in the client's plants, looking at your systems, uh, but these experiences and the things we're going to talk about may not match up 100% to your plant process and conditions. So uh, anyway, please review this uh, disclaimer. We'll take a pause for a few seconds, allow you to review, and then we'll continue with the program. Okay, so a lot of times when we talk about steam and steam systems and steam applications, there's a lot of focus to energy efficiency, which is certainly relevant, but what we're gonna focus on uh, in today's presentation, and if you've been following along with us the last few weeks, uh, we are really focused on uh, minimizing and mitigating risk. And we can quantify risk. You see an example here of a risk matrix where the probability of failure, we're uh, measuring and demonstrating on the y-axis consequence of failure on the x-axis. And you can see a couple of points here where based on inspecting the current condition of a piece of equipment or an application, we can plot and we can quantify its current level of risk. And what we're really about with the presentation with the things that we're gonna look at today is how do we take an as-is condition and with some of the proven things and uh, uh, tried and true examples we're gonna to discuss today, how do we reduce that probability of failure, therefore uh, reducing and helping to mitigate risk in the steam utilities and the steam processes throughout the plant. If you'd like to learn more uh, about this process of uh, risk-based inspection and mitigating risk, uh, here's another article that's available to you for reference. Uh, it's an article from the May-June 2017 edition of Inspectioneering Journal magazine, authored by Dr. Brian Kane. Uh, you can find this article on the TLV website. Uh, it reviews how we take the principles of the API risk-based inspection standards 580 and 581 and apply that specifically to uh, steam utilities and steam applications. So uh, please uh, review that article if you'd like to learn more information about that. Also, in terms of entire STEAM system optimization, uh, here's another article that's available for review. It's the May 2018 edition from Hydrocarbon Processing, an article by our Global Manager of uh, Engineering Services, Mr. Tetsuya Mita, and one of our cons senior consulting engineers, Alan Ho. Uh, this article is also available on TLV's website that uh, outlines our STEAM system optimization program. 
So basically, uh, or through three phases of steam trap management, phase one, uh, uh, focused on application management, which we're really gonna focus on today, phase two, and overall steam system, steam balance, phase three, uh, is our optimate, op, excuse me, optimization program for uh, steam system asset management. So uh, please, if you'd like to, uh, refer to that article for further information. Okay, so let's dive down and focus on specifically the topic today, uh, thermal maintenance and uh, steam heat tracing. How to mitigate risk in that area? Well, why do we wanna mitigate risk? What are some of the issues that we may be faced with, uh, problems we may see, if we are not able to maintain process temperatures in our product and process transport lines. Uh, if we can't maintain temperature, certainly that's gonna have an impact on our uh, process fluid viscosity. And if we see an increase in that viscosity, it's gonna be harder to move that fluid. Our pumps are gonna work harder. We could see pump motor failures. Uh, if we see full solidification, actually freezing in the lines, freezing up valves, uh, product lines, obviously that's gonna disrupt our production process. Uh, hopefully we can reestablish heat and thaw things out, but it, it could be, uh, you know, more significant than that. It could be a, quite a lengthy shutdown uh, if we have to clean out lines, valves, uh, failing pipes, those kinds of things. Um, we're also using a lot of these thermal management maintenance systems in our analyzers and our process control. Uh, if we don't have good uh, heating in those systems, we can get malfunction in metering, uh, inaccurate process readings. Uh, that also can create issues for uh, productivity in our process or potentially causing the process to go offline. So there's some significant impact if we're not able to reliably operate our thermal maintenance systems. A lot of times when we have these kind of problems and issues, we just add more tube tracers. Uh, that's kind of a Band-Aid. Really what we're going to talk about today is uh, a long-term solution, eliminating the root cause of these issues so that we can get the systems to operate more reliably. Okay, so tracing the causes of heat maintenance, focus on problems in steam heat tracing systems. Again, this is all based off of the December 2019 article by Jim Risco. Uh, there you see an image of it on your screen. Um, this article is included in the handouts today and is also available under the Steam Theory tab on the TLV website, tlv.com. So, you know, why is this, uh, you know, an important issue anyway? Uh, steam heat tracers, we've just got uh, typically some copper or stainless tubing running through the plant. You know, these we're just keeping our lines hot or warm. Uh, everything seems to be working okay. Um, certainly if you're somebody that's involved in steam trap management uh, or folks on the maintenance side and operations, this is a pretty significant issue because typically in the petrochemical industry, refining, uh, in petrochemical, 50 to 80% of your steam trap population uh, is going to be draining these kinds of thermal maintenance applications, tracing systems. So there's a lot to manage. Uh, there's a lot that we need to make sure is operating reliably to keep our lines hot. And you say, hey, well, my lines are hot. I really don't need to worry about it. But if we walk down into the operating units, are these the kind of things that we're going to see? We're going to see strainers that are... Uh, cracked open to bleed, bleed valves open, blow down valves open, unions open, all because the existing system somehow is choking or we're not able to remove that condensate. The lines start to cool. So we open these bleeders, trying to keep everything hot and everything moving. And the question is why? Why do we have to do that? So we're gonna to try to answer that question today. Before we answer that question, we're also going to talk a, lot, a little bit about and review these systems in general. So first, let's talk about the heating objectives that we're trying to achieve with these thermal maintenance systems. In the mo most basic or kind of simplest form, we have something uh, for like winterization. Just when times get cold, we want to keep things from freezing up. Typically, that's a simple uh, tracer tube, uh, convection type tracer running down our process line. If we need to put more temperature in there to uh, really make sure year round our processes and fluids are flowing, then we're getting more into thermal maintenance. Uh, again, could be convection tracer, or we could get more involved uh, with other types of 
uh, systems. If it's critical thermal maintenance, where we have a really more narrow bandwidth now of if the temperature gets too hot, it's a problem. If it gets too cold, it's a problem. Uh, then we need even more involved systems, uh, more precise controls to manage that process. And some of these systems are actually for heating up. So we're actually trying to increase the temperatures of our process fluid uh, as we're moving it throughout the transport piping. So as we move from winterization on the left to the critical heat up on the right, you can see how this becomes more complex. And certainly there's more engineering required in the design of the systems and also involved in the installation of the systems to get them to operate more reliably. So those are our heating objectives. Now, uh, what's, what are the actual systems that we're gonna utilize to accomplish those objectives? So uh, winterization, again, I said a simple uh, tube convective type tracer, uh, stainless or copper, half inch, three eighths, something like that, filled with steam running down our process lines, uh, trying to keep them from freezing. Uh, if we need thermal maintenance, where we're trying to maintain that fluid temperature and viscosity for flow, we might, might need to put more heat into that process and use an enhanced tube. So now we're not just convecting heat uh, in the process, but we're actually conducting heat by putting a heat sink, some heat transfer compound to increase the surface area and conduct more heat into our process to maintain those fluid temperatures. Uh, in uh, critical bandwidth, we can make sure it doesn't get too cold or too hot. Uh, we want to put more heat to the tube, to the process line. We can use this channel type tracing, and we're going to talk about that. That's typically a, a band on or bolt on construction. And the most involved uh, where we can put uh, more heat into the process is to surround that entire process pipe in steam. And we do that through a jacketed pipe system so we can conduct heat around the entire circumference of the pipe. So we'll review these, each of these systems in more detail now. So let's stop, start with the simple convective type tube tracer, uh, stainless or copper. As I said, you can see it here, running down the pipe, uh, twisted around a valve here and continuing on. Uh, typically we're looking at copper or stainless tube as shown in this cross section. Uh, laid up against the pipe, very small amount of contact surface directly, really just with the outside circumference of the tube and the pipes come in contact with each other. And we're trying to convect heat around this entire airspace to keep the process from freezing or something from freezing to keep it warm. So we have our process fluid, our product pipe, the uh, heated tube tracers here convecting heat throughout this area. And of course, we want to keep the heat in because the fluid is going to be radiating out through the pipes. So we have insulation to do that, to accomplish that. If we want to put more heat into the process, now we can get more involved with the enhanced type and utilize heat transfer compound. So what heat transfer compound allows us to do is to put more heat. Therefore, we can reduce the number of tracers. It allows us to maintain more even temperatures across our, uh, our uh, transport line, our process fluid, prevents the formation of cold spots. Here's some examples how heat transfer compound can increase the temperature, make the heating more effective uh, in different process fluid line sizes, four inch, six inch, and eight inch. And in the uh, highlighted areas, you see the impact with heat transfer compound. Uh, compared to just a bare tracer uh, against the pipe, convecting heat in that area. In a four inch and six inch process pipe, you can see we're actually increasing the surface temperature of the pipe by 30 degrees just by utilizing heat transfer compound. Not as much here in the eight inch pipe. We've got a larger uh, pipe, more volume, more area to control, but still able to increase that. These examples are based off of looking at 150 pound uh, steam heat tracer. So um, this is just some typical examples. This may not be exactly the results that you would achieve uh, with your process fluid. So please consult the heat transfer heat thermal maintenance companies like Control Southeast and others for actual results with their systems applied to your process. But again, the basic message here is with the heat transfer compound, it's much more efficient. We can impact and put much more heat into our transport lines. Okay, we're gonna move further up into the scale uh, for more critical tracing. And this is where we use uh, jacketed type systems. So you see the photo here with an example of a product or process fluid transport line. 
and some bolt-on tracing, uh, two channels of this channel type jacket tracing. Let's take a look at the construction. In the cross section here, we have our process fluid, the core process pipe, and then we're going to uh, bolt up to that two channels around the pipe where here it's actually formed to fit the circumference of the pipe. We'll fill any air gaps between there with a heat transfer compound to make sure that we can conduct as much of that heat as possible from the heating medium of steam into our process fluid. So we're really able to uh, conduct uh, a lot of heat, keep things hot, control that temperature, and at the same time, again, there's gonna be uh, some radiation that would occur here. We're gonna have that insulated to keep that heat into the pipe. And then the last system we're gonna review is a jacketed pipe section. So this is where we're going to fully uh, envelop the entire circumference of the pipe with steam. So it's basically a pipe within a pipe, a process pipe surrounded by the jacketed steam pipe. And we're able to, at that point, conduct heat around this entire circumference. So we have our process fluid, we have our outer process pipe shown here, the steam outer pipe on the outside here, the jacketed pipe, and our heating mediums of steam around the entire circumference. So we're able to conduct a lot of heat into the process fluid. Uh, in some cases, we can actually put enough heat in there to increase the temperature. And again, we have that surrounded by insulation to keep everything warm. So that's a quick overview of the different types of systems, basic from a convection type to the most involved conductive type uh, system uh, being jacketed pipe. So now let's take a look at these systems uh, on the steam supply and condensate recovery and see what that looks like. So now we're looking at a cross section of a tracing system. We have our product transport lines shown here. Uh, we have steam main off of which we're supplying down to a distribution manifold. We're going to use this for applications like, again, our product lines. We could use it for instrument tracing. Uh, this could be, also could be going to uh, uh, jacketed systems and uh, uh, bolt-on channel tracing systems. But we're starting from a steam distribution manifold here coming off the main header. The manifold allows us to separate off efficiently to a number of different supply circuits or tracer lines. Going down our product pipe, you see an individual tracer circuit. And at the end, of course, all of the steam that's giving off its heat, its latent heat, it's condensing. We're going to remove that condensate from a steam trap. An efficient way to do that at the other end is a condensate collection manifold that you see here with a blowdown valve. And a good practice is also to have uh, pre freeze drainage. Um, in the event that this system is taking out of service, then uh, as the temperature lowers and reduces, a thermostatic trap to remove that condensate. So now let's uh, take a closer look at the steam supply side of this. Uh, so here we have an example of our steam supply manifold, supply coming off of the main header, down to the uh, supply uh, distribution manifold here. And you can see we're taking steam off, supplying it up to our individual tracing circuits. Uh, the steam is going to be condensing just as a basic like a drip application here that we call it. So we want to make sure we remove that condensate. It doesn't back up and move down our tracing system. So we have a drip trap here and a blow down to make sure any dirt and debris that's captured down in this assembly we can uh, frequently uh, remove that so it doesn't get up and create problems with our drain trap or our manifold system. So this is basic uh, good practice for a steam supply manifold. So now let's take a look at the other end of this, which is the condensate recovery. And so now we're looking at our process pipe, our uh, tracers moving down here. We have our condensate collection manifold. We're gonna utilize a system with trap stations and manifolds here, where through gravity drainage, the steam is condensing, moving down to the trap station, the steam trap, we can efficiently and effectively capture it here to return it back to our condensate return lines. Again, we have a blowdown because we'll have some dirt and debris that's moving down in the system. We wanna keep it uh, away and not moving up to condensate, getting it out of the system. And also, as I said before, pre-freeze drainage, which is typically a, a thermostatic. Uh, we use a bimetallic 
type uh, steam trap is uh, our best practice. And so if this complete system is pulled out of service, what it will do is drain the system when the temperature gets low, so this will not freeze up. Um, so here's another example of a condensate return manifold. Here, the first one we looked at was three circuits coming down to basically like a four station arrangement. Here you see on the right, a 12 station arrangement. And this is uh, very efficient, a very small footprint. We can collect condensate from a, as you can see, 12 different uh, heat thermal maintenance circuits uh, in a very compact space. Uh, this is usually about the largest uh, manifold system that we would manufacture or, or provide because once we start to get up, as you can imagine, the height increases here to about six feet with a 12 station manifold. So usually that's about um, uh, the largest number of tracers that you can uh, safely integrate into a vertical circuit or a vertical manifold would be 12 circuits into a condensate collection manifold. Okay. So that's a little bit about the types of uh, thermal maintenance systems, some of the construction and the supply of manifold systems. Let's take a look at some of the, uh, the unique type of tracing applications and what that means from the steam trap selection side. So first, let's go back to the, uh, the basic isolated convective type tracer. The details of this application, typically we're looking at lower temperatures, uh, winterization type, uh, service, it's really uh, usually not that critical. Uh, so lower, maybe lower pressures as well. Um, and so because the temperatures might not be so critical, we're just trying to keep it warm. Oftentimes what we'll do is select a steam trap, a thermostatic type trap that will subcool and back up condensate. And a lot of times that's actually preferred um, in many of these cases with the isolated convective tracers, um, you know, because they're few and far between, so to speak, uh, we don't capture them into a manifold. They just drop down uh, and it's a bare unsupported tracer. Um, so we're not recovering that condensate. And if we don't need that temperature, we can subcool it and actually use a sensible heat uh, of the condensate to heat the process rather than the latent heat of steam. And it's, that's much more energy efficient. We can keep that latent heat inside the system. So utilizing these kind of uh, subcooling or thermostatic traps from an energy efficiency point of view that only buys us that value if we are not recovering the condensate if we are recovering the condensate that doesn't give us any benefit in energy but uh, certainly if we are not and we are dropping it down to the powder grade well then if we're able to heat uh, with sensible heat and therefore use it, utilize a subcooling type thermostatic steam trap well then that will be much more energy efficient for our plant Okay, so as I mentioned, usually these are isolated uh, tracers. We use the terminology unsupported. So they're not secured to any equipment. They're not secured to a pipe rack. We're, we're dropping them down, uh, and then we're gonna mount a steam trap in there. So um, again, looking at the application, what does that mean from a, a trap point of view? Typically low pressures. Uh, we need something that's small, lightweight, and easy to install. Uh, the load requirements are typically very, very light. And as I said before, if we're not recovering that condensate, then a lot of times what we'll do is use a thermostatic type uh, steam trap for those kind of services. If we do need a uh, hot temperature up there, well, then we're going to need to go with a steam trap that discharges at uh, near to steam temperature would be a free float or thermodynamic type. So here's some different steam trap options, uh, balanced pressure capsule, bimetal thermostatic, uh, thermodynamic and free float. Uh, in these cases with the unsupported tracers, since the uh, tubing is free at the discharge, uh, usually we'll use what we call an inline product where the tubes will connect directly to the end fittings of the steam trap. So it's pretty easy just to change the trap out. We don't have secured piping creating difficulties to do that. So uh, these are the types of products usually we use for that service. But one thing you definitely want to take note of is if you do need a hot discharge and you're going to use a mechanical type steam trap like a free float, Again, this is unsupported tracing and mechanical steam traps are very sensitive to uh, orientation. So you wanna make sure that that steam trap uh, is gonna be oriented properly uh, so it operates reliably, doesn't leak, uh, and will open when it needs to. That's one of the things you need to take uh, notice of when using a mechanical type trap in an unsupported application. But these are some of the options that you can choose for unsupported tracing. 
Now let's shift to the same type of application, a convective type tracer, but it's supported. So it is mechanically secure. Uh, we still have all the same requirements or conditions as far as the pressures, and we may or may not be recovering that condensate. But now since it's mechanically supported, we can go with a, a little bit heavier type steam trap. Uh, here in this example, what we're showing is a universal type two bolt mounting system. So uh, here what you see are examples of these pipeline strainer connectors, and that's what's mounted uh, in our permanently in our piping system or our tracers. So they'll be coming in, bolted in directly, and uh, then we can just mount a two bolt steam trap on there. So it makes it very easy to remove and replace that steam trap when the maintenance is required. Another approach we could take uh, in supported applications is the trap valve station. So I showed this earlier in the uh, reference slide for the condensate return manifold, but this is a little bit closer look. So what a trap valve station allows us to do is to integrate a lot of functionality for that condensate discharge location in a small package. We have our inlet and outlet isolation valves, the two valves that you see here. Also integrated into this is an upstream strainer with blowdown valve to relieve pressure and blow down on the inlet side of the trap. And there's also a test port at the bottom here to relieve pressure and uh, isolate and look at flow on the outlet side of the trap. So you get all that functionality in a very compact package. And we can that's certainly something that you can do when you're mechanically supporting that system. Uh, is to utilize this kind of trap valve station to make it efficient for maintenance and operation in the future. Okay, that's convective tracers. Now let's look at something a little bit more critical. Uh, so we need to put more heat. Temperature is very important to us. Uh, otherwise, we could have issues with solidification of our process fluid, um, and we don't want that to happen and create any bottlenecks or issues in our process. So now let's look at these details of the application. Usually we're dealing with higher temperatures now and it's critical. We need to maintain those temperatures. Uh, therefore, we want to avoid subcooling or backing up condensate. So we probably are not going to choose a thermostatic type steam trap for that type of application. So from a trap recommendation point of view, we'll be dealing with medium to higher pressures now because we need more temperature. We want continuous drainage at those saturation temperatures without subcooling and back up. The condensate loads are still pretty light. Usually we're dealing with something in the range of maybe 25 to maybe at the most 50 pounds an hour, but usually more in the area of 25 pounds an hour. And again, minimal to no condensate uh, backup here. So from a trap selection point of view, we're going to select a technology that's going to discharge at near to steam temperature. Minimize that backup, minimize that subcooling. And from a technology point of view, that would be a thermodynamic type steam trap or a, uh, a free flow to mechanical type steam trap to utilize in that service. So we're getting a good hot, hot discharge, keeping those thermal maintenance lines very hot, no backup, no subcooling by utilizing this type of steam trap for that service. Now we move into the, uh, let's say the most demanding or most critical systems, the, the jacketed pipe and the uh, bolt on channel tracing systems. Okay, so now we're really needing to conduct heat into that process. Our temperatures need to be precise, a lot of heat to maintain that viscosity and keep things going. We can't have any cold spots or uneven heating in there. And another thing we need to pay attention to with the uh, bolt on channel tracing and also with the jacket of piping systems are the jumpers. So, as you see here, uh, jumper between the different sections of jacketed pipe. Uh, if these sections are uh, daisy chained with several of them in series, we need to pay attention to that. That also can create some temperature issues based on the way that piping is configured. From a steam trap recommendation, again, medium to higher pressures, continuous drainage at the saturation temperature. We may see heavier condensate loads. Uh, again, nothing too crazy, but uh, we might be around 50 pounds an hour. It could move even upwards of 100 pounds an hour, but usually around 50, something in that range. Again, it varies depending upon the process fluids that you're trying to heat. And again, no backupping of condensate. So um, what kind of technology? Again, a near to steam discharge, steam temperature discharge is what we're looking for here. Uh, it's gonna be a free float or a thermodynamic type steam trap that we would choose for that type of service. 
And here's another uh, example of just something to take a look at. This is actually a very compact uh, condensate recovery system for thermal maintenance. You see a variety of uh, tracing circuits coming down. We're collecting them at a condensate recovery manifold as we showed earlier, but uh, maybe we don't have enough differential pressure to actually uh, recover that and push that up to our condensate return system. So what we're actually doing here is we're collecting at a manifold, uh, we're flashing that hot condensate off to the atmosphere, and we're recovering it through a motive steam pump here that we would collect a higher pressure motive and use that to run pumping cycles through here and recover that condensate into our system. So a nice little compact package uh, based on the size of the vent line and the manifold, we could handle a fat flash steam load of 130 pounds an hour at 150 PSI steam. That would be uh, a load that would be generated off of 800 pounds an hour of condensate. So, uh, you know, typically with these kind of systems here, uh, we're going to be well below 800 pounds an hour coming off of those individual and isolated tracer circuits. So again, in each case, we've got to take a look at what the requirements are for your application. But uh, this is a nice little com compact package that could be utilized to recover the condensate with the manifold and return it with the uh, TLV power trap, the motive steam pump. Okay, so let's review uh, some of the things we've talked about and a few other tips. So we talked about the different types of tracing. We need to understand what our heating service requirements are to choose either convective or conductive type system. Um, we want to make sure that uh, with our selection of tracers, we have a single, single tracer, excuse me, uh, on the piping run, or if we need more heat, maybe instead of going to multiple convection type, we go with an enhanced uh, or a bolt-on type jacket to uh, keep the number of tracers to a minimum. We certainly also need to take into account the tubing size and length for each of our tracing circuits. We may to, uh, need to account not just for uh, running of the process, but maybe for cold startup as well. So that might be something else we need to look at when we're selecting the system and sizing how much heat we need to put into the process and selecting which uh, thermal maintenance system we wanna use. Uh, as we just reviewed, we wanna choose the correct uh, configuration for supply and drainage and the correct steam trap as well to make that work. Some other things to look at, we wanna make sure through installation we uh, don't have any flattening where we have kinks or bends in the piping, that's gonna reduce our outside diameter and choke the system. Uh, another good practice is to insulate the supply to the tracing system, to the thermal maintenance system and the drainage from it. And a good best practice to do that is to utilize pre-insulated tubing, a very simple solution to accomplish that goal. The tracing joints, uh, where we're joining together different sections, they shouldn't be uh, underneath insulation so that we can access them uh, freely and easily, need be. And also when we're installing tubing runs, we wanna pay attention to any expansion joints and those should be horizontal so that we can uh, not create any kind of a vertical loop, either drop down loop seal or something that would have us to lift condensate. We'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. And uh, last but not least, when we're laying these systems out, a lot of times what happens is that uh, we just get out in the field and we uh, uh, maybe have contractors come out or whatever, we start running these systems and uh, we do a tubing takeoff with a valve and some traps at the other end. And we really should have a plan. We should have a plan for uh, where the isolation valves would be, a tagging system to mark, uh, to connect between a steam trap, a tracing trap that might be you know, 100 feet away from the isolation valve. So we know how uh, to match everything together to safely isolate individual circuits, uh, turn them off, turn them on, isolate the traps for maintenance, those kinds of things. So another best practice to think of. So, okay. Well, we've reviewed the, the different types of thermal maintenance systems, steam supply, condensate recovery, trap selection, that's pretty easy, we're done. Well, maybe we're not done, wait, not so fast. We need to examine the tip of the flow arrow. What do we mean by that? Well, inside these systems, we've got two phase flow. We've got steam in the vapor phase and we've got condensate in the liquid phase. And to remove the condensate from that system, condensate's gonna be heavier than steam. It's gonna drop down. We wanna make sure that our drainage devices are gravity fed. So if we're dropping condensate down to the drainage device, we've got condensate or blue at the tip of the flow arrow. 
and that's good. That's basically how we want these systems designed and installed to have blue at the tip of the flow arrow, but we may not always have blue at the tip of the flow arrow. In this case, we've got horizontal run, so two-phase flow. We've got steam and condensate. So a steam trap wants to close on steam, open on condensate, but now we've got both. The trap gets a little confused with that red at the tip of the flow arrow. And certainly if we have any application where we're lifting, we're trying to lift condensate throughout the system or get it up to the trap, well then we have steam at the tip of the flow arrow. And anytime we have red and steam at the tip of the flow arrow, that means we need to do something different than a standard steam trap. We need something with a controlled steam lock release. So let's talk a little bit more about that. Basic functions of a steam trap. Well, we want to discharge condensate. That's job number one. We want to prevent live steam loss, so the trap should be closed when steam gets to the trap. And we want to discharge air, other non-condensables as well. But in this case, let's just focus on discharging condensate and preventing live steam loss, okay? How do we do that most efficiently with some of these systems? Typically, it's okay when we have a gravity feed to a steam trap, but we may not always have that kind of a luxury or that kind of a, a system installed out in the field. So here's an example. You see our steam trap here, and actually we have a lift from the drain line where we're lifting up to the trap. That lift can create a locking condition. We've got red at the tip of our flow arrow, and you can see the uh, animation here. Uh, what's going to happen? Basically, we have steam that's captured up to the trap, and we have to wait for this steam to condense and collapse, and that volume to collapse, and that volume can be uh, displaced by the liquid eventually so that we can lift and move the condensate up to the steam trap here and drain the system. So now we're draining the system and we're going to remove the condensate, but once that condensate is removed, again, we're going to reset and it's basically going to cause this condition to cycle with long lags or delays in between as this steam locking condition occurs. And that's going to be a problem for anything that's upstream here because now we're going to start to back up condensate and it could impact our process temperature. So let's take a look at it now in a complete illustration. Uh, of a system. Here we have our product or process pipe dropping down with a gravity feed. That's great. We have condensate with a gravity feed at the tip of our flow arrow, gravity drain. We can select a standard steam trap for that application. But here we have similar process product pipe up in a rack dropping down, but now we have a lift up to the steam trap. So that lift is going to give us red at the tip of the flow arrow. That's going to create a steam lock condition, condition excuse me, and then we're going to need a trap with an option with a steam lock release option in order to maintain reliable flow. Okay, let's look at that in a little bit more detail in a tube tracing convective type tracer application. So a typical example, we're moving steam down our tracing line, dropping down to a steam trap or a manifold system as we show here, this is gravity drainage, no problem. We have blue at the tip of our flow arrow, we have a standard trap we can use, but if Anywhere in this system, we have lifts or lift up to the trap. We'll have steam at the tip of the flow arrow, and we're going to need a trap with a controlled steam lock release. So here's something interesting. I imagine that we could walk out into all of our plants, and there's probably some process line and some operating unit that looks like this. And the question is, well, what's wrong with this picture? Is there anything wrong with this picture? Yes, this is a steam tracer. It's not an electric tracer. What we've done with the tracing line is we've brought it down, we've actually coiled it and wrapped it around the pipe. And this wrapping, this vertical wrapping, creates steam locking throughout this entire system. So we're, we're dropping down, but now we have to lift. And we've got to lift it up with right at the tip of the flow, flow arrow and we lift and we lift and so all these areas where we're steam locking throughout here these create problems for draining this system we're going to have hot hot areas cold spots inconsistent heating this is a problem don't wrap tracers around the process line okay here's uh now an example with the enhanced tubing 
Ideally, again, we're going to gravity feed and drain down to the steam trap. If we do that, we can select a standard steam trap here in the manifold. But again, if we have any kind of an uplift, well, then we're going to have to select a trap with a steam lock release option. Similar system here now with jacketed pipe. Let's take a look at that. So steam supply, condensate recovery. Now you can see here's our steam jackets. Each one of these is a section of jacketed pipe. And these are our jumpers. So we have the steam jumpers on the top, condensate jumpers on the bottom. So we're feeding the system uh, consistently and continuously with the steam jumpers on top. Condensate's gonna collect at the bottom. These will be little loop seals, but we'll keep moving it down. But this is okay. We're gonna daisy chain them together and we're gonna gravity feed this steam trap with condensate at the tip of the flow arrow. We can select the standard trap for this type of service. However, not all of the jacketed pipe systems that we see installed in the field are configured with jumpers like this where we're jumpering the steam on the top and the condensate at the bottom. This is uh, not uncommon to see something that looks like this. So we have a jacketed pipe system where we're taking off the drain here and connecting to the supply here in this S-shaped connector. So we're having to drop down steam and condensate trying to get that to move through this loop that is flooded with water, somehow get the steam up through there to feed the next section, get the condensate up through there to get in the next section to eventually get it get down to a drainage device. So these uplifts, they create problems. We have locking. So typically you're gonna go out there, you're gonna see unions that are cracked open, some kind of bleeders, something on there to remove the condensate, to keep things moving, to get that system to stay hot and move our process fluids reliably. Here's a cross section of that same S arrangement, but now you can see with the different colors to illustrate these different condensate loop seals that we're gonna have in the system utilizing this kind of an S connector arrangement. And this is gonna create locking. Uh, this is gonna be a problem where we have red at the tip of the flow arrow, and we cannot use a standard steam trap in this type of application. We need to put something with a controlled steam lock release so that we can maintain consistent flow and keep things moving in this, uh, in this kind of a configuration, a steam trap with an option. Here's a channel a tracing system. So uh, we have different sections that are connected together here in series, and we're gonna connect them together with these uh, U or jumper uh, uh, flexible hoses that go in between those systems. And the orientation of these is very important. As you can see here, these are actually dropped down. So again, we're creating these loop seals on here. And again, that's gonna create a situation where we need to lift. We've got red at the tip of our flow arrows here. We're gonna create a steam locking condition. And the only way to address that is if we have a trap with a steam lock release option. Okay, so We've gone through some of the different configurations and where we can get into locking. And I keep saying a steam lock release option. What do I mean by that? So now let's take a little bit closer look at a steam lock condition and a steam trap application. So this is illustrating a long horizontal run into the trap, condensate at the bottom and steam on top. So the trap really isn't sure what it wants to do. It wants to close on steam. It wants to open on condensate. It is not gonna provide uh, continuous and consistent drainage. So in these kind of applications, what we want to do is ha have some kind of a steam lock release. One way to do it is through an external bypass. So we have condensate steam both coming down. We install a bypass pipe with a small valve, maybe a needle valve or something like this, bypassing the pipe. We can continuously, consistently remove the steam, feed condensate directly into the volume here of the trap, and efficiently remove it. So that's one way to accomplish the steam lock release is through an external bypass. Another way to do it is with an internal bypass inside the steam trap. So here we're looking at a cross section of a mechanical type free flow trap and right up here in this area that's a bypass. That's a small hole about nine millimeters that's uh, drilled there between the steam compartment or chamber and the condensate chamber side of the trap. And we'll have a small continuous bleed so we can vacate steam from the trap, vacate that volume, allow condensate to freely move in and reliably drain the system with a controlled 
internal bypass here in the trap. Uh, we talked about lifts. Again, with a long horizontal piping run, this could be potentially uh, another steam locking scenario. So we're gonna need to integrate or utilize a trap with uh, uh, controlled steam lock release option in that case. Also, if we have any loops or bends in the inlet piping to the trap, where uh, condensate can collect and uh, uh, gather in a loop seal, again, we want to uh, eliminate this steam lock with a controlled lock release at the steam trap. And you know, here's a real live example. Uh, so we're looking at long horizontal runs into steam traps. So we've got two phase flow in here and steam collecting at the trap that that volume has to be just condensed or collapse eventually to uh, be displaced and let the condensate freely flow into the trap. And so what we've done is open bypasses and unions and things to allow that system to drain freely. Okay, so uh, let's review. We've got in our trap selections, if we're dealing with systems where we have gravity feed, dropping down to the steam trap, where we have blue at the tip of our flow arrow, we can select a standard steam trap for that application. If we have any kind of an uplift anywhere in the uh, thermal circuit or lifting up to the steam trap, that's gonna create a steam lock condition. And then there we need a trap with that steam lock release option. Okay, a couple of other applications to take a look at here. Now let's take a look at something specifically with utilizing copper tube tracing and a phenomenon we call copper leaching. So what are we talking about? Well, first off with copper tracing, uh, it's a lot easier to install than stainless. Uh, it's easier to bend, uh, it's less expensive, it has better conductive properties. So maybe we wanna go with a copper system. But uh, what I'm seeing after a couple of years in service is my tube fittings, my bends in the tubing and my steam traps are getting plugged with copper. Why does this keep happening? Do I have an issue with my condensate or my boiler treatment? So I switch to stainless, should I switch to a different steam trap? So let's examine why this is happening in the first place or what's impacting it. Copper leaching. What copper leaching basically is the mechanism of the copper tubing corroding and that is occurring because of the, uh, the condition of the steam. We wanna control the pH. Uh, typically in a range of seven to nine. Uh, when it drifts outside of that, it will start to get aggressive and break down that copper, causing it to corrode and, and dissolve into the condensate. And also with some of the boiler treatments like ammonia, which we're gonna use ammonia in the system, uh, we're gonna use that to control the pH, but that also can aggressively uh, break down the system. So some of these variables that impact how aggressive uh, the copper will break down, temperature is one, so the higher the pressure, the higher the temperature. It's gonna cause our copper to break down more quickly over time. And as I uh, started to get into a moment ago, the chemical imbalance, so our water treatment, our pH levels, uh, we wanna keep it between seven and nine. And if we get high ammonia content, that will break it down. So here's some examples of uh, copper tracing applications. Uh, you see different pressure levels here in bar uh, from three and a half up to eight and a half. And the first four applications here, we don't have any problem with these traps. These traps are providing reliable service. They're not blocking, but let's take a look at these last two conditions where the traps blocked. In condition number five, you can see the pH value. So we started to drop down in the acidic range. That started to break down the copper and that copper dissolved in the solution and created uh, eventually a problem at the steam trap. Uh, and then in uh, example number six here, we have an example, you see the very high ammonia content, which also was very aggressive on the copper tubing, causing it to break down, eventually creating problems in our system. Okay, so let's look at the entire chain of this reaction process. Uh, how is this all happening? So the copper oxidation is going to occur. It's going to occur uh, even in a perfect system. The question is how aggressive is it going to occur? How rapidly will the system break down? Uh, pH levels and ammonia temperature, they can cause it to be more aggressive. But eventually those copper ions are going to release from the pipe. They will get into, absorb into the condensate and form a solution. 
Okay, now that solution is going to pass across the steam trap orifice as you see here. And so we've got hot liquid from a high pressure, hot condensate here, discharging to a lower pressure system. And as we know through our uh, thermodynamics and steam tables, that hot condensate is going to flash out to steam. And when that flashes out to steam, what's going to happen is uh, the vapor will separate, but the copper that was dissolved in that solution, it's going to separate out and become a solid again, a precipitate. And it's going to separate out and start to build up here at the outlet of the orifice and eventually build up and potentially block the steam trap. And so when we open a trap in copper service, we might find something that looks like this. You know, orifices that are plugged, orifice that's blocked, block tubing, these kinds of things. You know, what should we do? We should consult the steam trap manufacturer for their recommendations. There is no steam trap that is impervious to copper leasing, leaching, excuse me, and blocking. All traps will block. The question is, what kind of features do we uh, design in there to enhance it that it will uh, hopefully not block quickly, or if it does block, we can clean and clear it. So let's take a look at some of the options from at least the TLV side. One is a bimetallic type steam trap that you see here, uh, designed specifically for copper tracing. And this technology has a cleaning auger built into the design of the steam trap. So here at the bottom of the trap, we have an auger. So here you see the cross section of the auger and the operation of it here. So we're gonna operate this set screw that controls the temperature setting and, and the cleaning with a screwdriver here up top. And we loosen the lock nut and we'll see the animation occur again here. We see that turn down and basically auger out any copper that's built up here in the orifice and around it. And then we'll flush that out when we put the trap back in service and establish a, a clean and clear steam trap without having to remove it from service. So that's one option that we have a uh, special purpose device. Also that bimetal design will subcool and that will also help minimize a lot of the flashing and some of the separation. Here's the next technology, a thermodynamic type steam trap. And with this design, what we do is we've designed in an enlarged port on the outlet of the trap. So basically trying to let it last uh, longer than as, as if it had a smaller port to block. So here you see a cross section of the trap, a single large port on the outlet. Here's an example of the cross section of the trap. So you can see what it looks like here. So we have an enlarged port at the top and a straight drop down into the outlet piping. There's no turns, there's no bends, there's no corners for, uh, for copper to collect and block the uh, outlet flow path of the trap. Uh, again, trying to make this operate uh, as long as possible and reliably. And also with this single port dropping down, uh, what uh, some users do is actually um, isolate the trap, remove the cover and clean that port out and put it back in service. So that's another option we have for copper tracing service. Uh, last option is maybe we have a, a critical heating process and we absolutely need near to steam temperature discharge is a mechanical steam trap. So this is one of our free float designs but we have a K port, K for clean out, and that's gonna be located here at the back side of the trap or the orifice. We can get access in there and clean out and clear a block trap. So the cross section of that, you see a cross section of a free float steam trap, and here is our K port. So basically this is a, a plug that's located here. We can remove and thread out this plug, and now we have access in the case of a block orifice here, we can remove that and we can come up with some type of a welding rod or a clean out rod and clean that out, clean the debris. And now we have an open flow path, the orifice is clear and we can resume normal and reliable operation. So those are a few trap options, specifically uh, special purpose built designed for copper tracing service. Instrument tracing is another specific application that we need to make sure that uh, we select the right steam trap technology for that kind of service. So with instrument tracing, uh, we have to be careful that we don't want it to be too hot. Um, what we're trying to do is to keep the, uh, the takeoff lines from the process fluid that are running to our analyzers just warm enough uh, to get it to our uh, instruments and analyzers so we can control and monitor what's going on. So we need to keep it warm enough that it doesn't freeze, but not too hot that we get any disruptions or uh, bad measurements or burning up of our instruments. So you see 
An example coming off of the tracer circuit, dropping down to an instrument, down to the instrument enclosure with the front and the side view here. And for this kind of service where we don't want it to get too hot, we're not gonna select a trap that discharges it near the steam temperature. We're gonna select a thermostatic type design that subcools. So we're gonna pick a trap that subcools. Typically for this service, we're gonna use a biometallic design. So we can set that for a specific discharge temperature to control this environment for our instruments and our analyzers. Okay, so now let's summarize. We wanna drain down where possible. As we examined before, blue at the tip of our flow arrow, that's good. We can use a standard steam trap. Long horizontal runs, we, have, uh, we do have blue, but we also have red at the tip of that flow arrow, so that could be steam locking. We need to make sure we use uh, technology with a controlled steam lock release. And certainly if we've had any lift up to the trap or lifting in the system, again, potential loop seals and steam locking, we need to make sure we select a trap with a steam lock release option uh, for that service as well. Uh, here's an example of something we call a STAR steam trap application review and an application table specifically for uh, tracing service. We aren't gonna read all these in detail, but again, let's summarize some of the things we talked about in today's presentation. For low temperature service, like for instrument tracing uh, and low temperature tracing, convective type tracing. Uh, typically, we're gonna go with a thermostatic type steam trap. That's the technology you see recommended here, choice number one for those types of service. And here's some comments here about how to set that steam trap for the amount of subcooling uh, and things to consider when installing and selecting uh, biometallic type design. If we go up where we need higher temperature service, whether we're looking at supported or unsupported, well, now we're looking for traps that have a hotter discharge. So we're primarily selecting something in the mechanical free float area or thermodynamic area. If it's uh, supported or unsupported, as we reviewed earlier, that's gonna impact the type of trap that we select. And here's some notes about that, that if it is unsupported in a mechanical steam trap, we need to be very careful about the orientation so that that trap's gonna operate for us reliably. Copper tracing service, as we just reviewed, no trap is impervious to blocking, but uh, we wanna, if we can select a technology uh, that's got some kind of features or options that can allow it to operate uh, more reliably, hopefully take longer intervals between blocking or if when it does block, we have an ability to clean and clear it. So here's some of the technology options we have there and how to do that, whether we're using thermostatic or a hot discharge trap, and with the jacket of pipe systems and the bolt-on channel tracing systems as we reviewed, how some of those jumpers uh, are interconnected in the orientation of them, they can be very much prone to locking conditions. So uh, for a lot of those services, we're gonna select number one, a trap that has a hot discharge, like a mechanical free float or a thermodynamic, but we also wanna make sure that we integrate a steam lock release uh, function, a controlled steam lock release function where needed. So these are just some generic examples. As always, consult your manufacturer, your steam trap manufacturer in this case for your particular service and uh, review the requirements of your application to match up the test technology and models that best suit your needs. Uh, another technical resource that's available to you uh, comes from an organization called the Fluid Controls Institute. Uh, we, TLV, are a member company as, as are other manufacturers of fluid controls products. If you go into the FCI website, you can find this particular technical paper that discusses the benefits of steam tracing versus electrical tracing, ST102. So uh, there's another reference that's available to you. And uh, bottom line, what we're trying to do with the review of today's discussion is to give you peace of mind with your uh, thermal maintenance and steam heat tracing systems. So we've talked about the design and construction, a couple other things we need to pay attention to as well is management of those steam traps to make sure that they are, are operating reliably, that they're doing job number one, which is removing condensate, and job number two, which is make sure that they're not leaking and keeping steam in the system. If you wanna learn more about a steam trap management program, we have a paper that describes that, implement a sustainable steam trap management program. John Walter, one of our collaborators on the line we introduced earlier, he's the gentleman that wrote that in the uh, January 2014 edition of CEP. And if we do have traps that are leaking and blowing into the condensate return system, that can cause issues of um, 
of water hammer in the return system. And so that's another topic that we're gonna talk about actually next Friday. Uh, Jim Risco is going to give his presentation on water hammer in the condensate return systems, uh, part two. So uh, please feel free to tune in and join that session with us next Friday, May the 15th at 11 a.m. Here is the registration link on GoToWebinar or uh, just wander into the TLV website in the seminar and training tab and you'll also find the registration links to enroll for this and our other webinars throughout the month of June. Quick review of TLV, uh, a little bit about our company. We've been around since 1950. We're celebrating our 70th anniversary this year. Uh, we are an ASME and an NPT manufacturer, so we uh, service all industries, uh, including nuclear, uh, nuclear certified. And of course, our quality and environmental systems are uh, validated certified to ISO 9001. Uh, we're a global organization. Here's our global network, uh, headquartered in Japan, our North American operations here. We're broadcasting from today in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, where we're responsible for uh, clients and the markets in US and Canada. So uh, that's the conclusion of today's presentation. Uh, again, I wanna thank Mr. Risco for all of his efforts basically to create these materials, to write the article, uh, to create the presentation materials, and a special acknowledgement also to Richard Newbigin, uh, our region manager in the Northeast Territory. He also contributed to a lot of the slides today. So thank you very much to Richard. So with that, I'm gonna ask uh, my collaborators, we're gonna turn our webcams back on and get to the conclusion of today's presentation. So, um, Mr. Walter, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, if there are any questions that we wanna discuss. Great, thank you, Noel. That was a, an excellent technical presentation. And I think there's a lot of valuable information in there that plants are gonna find very useful when they start working with their steam tracing systems. As you were talking, we did get a lot of technical questions coming in, and we've answered as many of those as we could. The ones that we haven't answered yet, we'll deal with those as soon as we finish the webinar today. Now, there were a few technical questions that repeated themselves and we thought might be useful for all of the participants to hear. So I'd like to ask Justin and Drew some questions now. The first one's for Drew. A couple of our listeners said that they've got critical temperature requirements for their process and they were wondering is there a steam trap out there that's guaranteed to fail open rather than fail closed? Well guaranteed is a very strong word. So there are some steam trap types that are going to be more likely to fail open or fail closed. Um, so a thermostatic or a therm thermodynamic are typically going to fail open, but that really depends on your system. Um, no trap is going to be guaranteed to fail open if the system has a lot of dirt, debris, and scale. That can cause any type of steam trap to fail. Now, if critical temperatures are required, um, and that is a huge concern, then you may want to look into something like continuous steam trap monitoring to monitor the temperature of those steam traps to take a proactive maintenance uh, response to those applications. Great, Th thank you very much for that, Drew. The next one's for Justin. Could you please explain the advantages and disadvantages of a vent hole compared to a bypass valve? Sure, thanks, John. So uh, VH or a vent hole uh, and an external bypass, they're basically two different methods for mitigating steam locking, condensing, and tracing systems. And unlike a, a VH, um, plant personnel have the ability to adjust the flow rate through an external bypass, and this carries some risk with it, such as reduced pressure upstream, um, increased return pressure, as well as water hammer the return line. And if any of these were to occur, it could significantly uh, negatively impact the performance of other traps in the system, uh, such as reduced capacity of those traps due to lower pressure differential. And of course, uh, the severity of the, those risks really depends on the opening percent and the type of bypass valve used. 
However, um, to break the steam lock, typically only a small amount of steam bleed is required, which is why TLD recommends a VH. So, and the VH is really just an engineered fixed internal bypass, and it's designed to bleed just enough steam to mitigate steam locking. And since it's internal to the steam trap, then it completely eliminates the possibility of plant personnel further opening or closing the bypass, which could otherwise cause some of the disruptions that I mentioned uh, just a minute ago. Great, thank you, Justin. So next question for Drew, what information does TLV need to be able to make a proper trap selection for a steam tracing application? All right, thanks, John. So for a steam tracing application, um, there's typically gonna be a few pieces of information uh, that are required. Uh, one, we're going to want to know the type of tracing that you have, uh, whether it's stainless steel, copper, uh, channel, or jacket. Um, <clears throat> and then we're going to need to know your steam pressures, obviously, to make the correct choice. Um, when it comes to tracing load, um, that, that can sometimes be difficult to figure out. Uh, most people don't have the information for steam load on their tracers, so that's something that we may be able to help you calculate. Um, but once we know the type of application, your pressure, and we can estimate some type of load, um, then we can make a reasonable uh, selection based on what your site preferences are for the type of steam trap uh, to get the best fit for your application. Great. Thank, thank you, Drew. And one last question for, for Justin. Can you explain the differences between supported and unsupported steam traps and when they are most appropriate? Sure, John. Great question. So a supported steam trap is going to be attached to any fixture. Um, it's really kind of designed to help minimize any motion of the steam trap. You typically see these in tracing applications which might use jacket piping, bolt-on tracing, or when several traps just, excuse me, discharge together into a common manifold. Um, an unsupported trap uh, might be installed on uh, basically without a fixture, um, such as a trap using tube tracing alone. And the trap orientation could possibly change if let's say an operator bumped into the trap. So typically you'd see these on low temperature applications or winterizing tracing, uh, but could also be seen in high temperature tracing where there's several tube tracers used together to meet those uh, the high temperature heat duty. So with the unsupported tracing, it's, it's really important to take special precautions during the trap selection process, um, considering things like flow direction and trap weight, since some technologies like mechanical traps are very sensitive to trap orientation. Great, thank, thank you, Justin. So, uh, Jim, you were following all of the Q&A that was going on in the background there, and I think you saw some common themes coming out which related to why you originally wrote the article. Could you make some closing comments on that, please? Sure, thanks, John. You know, when you look at so many tracing applications, one of the things that struck me was whenever I would see an S-loop on jacketed pipe and all the bleed steam from the cracked unions, not only is it unsafe, but what would happen is that the pressure is dropping and therefore the temperature is dropping and therefore the heat that goes into the product line for the viscosity management is also dropping. So I thought, you know, there was actually three key issues that occurred that I thought should be, you know, written about. One was a sulfur vapor line, and it had vertical vertical uh, bolt-on channel jacket tracing, if you will. And the outlet, the condensate outlet for that uh, sulfur vapor line was about 12 feet overhead. Now about 16 feet away, there was a manifold where the trap was about five feet off the ground. So there was about a seven foot drop going to that that manifold about 12 feet away but instead of taking PIT and running it straight to the trap no one had really taken a look at the system so what the the contractor did when they field ran the tracing is they ran it up 40 feet to the rack ran it over about 100 feet down another 40 feet to hit the tracer and created a huge steam lock so they were having quite difficult heat maintenance issues with that sulfur vapor line, which is a critical line. So I said, why not just run PIT along a piece of pipe where it was out of the way and run down to that trap as a solution? I thought so much stuff is field run without really thinking about what's trying to be accomplished. It needed some examples. That was one example. 
Another one was really interesting. There was a chemical plant in the Gulf Coast, somewhere between Florida and South Texas. And this particular plant kept complaining that the traps were blocking and they had were suffering viscosity problems because the traps were blocking. So whenever people would look at the traps, there was nothing blocking the traps. And we're like, well, the client can't be wrong. I mean, they're saying the, the traps are blocking. So by walking the site in about five minutes, you could see the problem. Normally, you want to see tracer line come down, gravity drain, and go into the manifold like this. But the contractor, when they installed the tracers, they had some slack. And they decided instead of putting the slack out this way or like this, they would put the slack under the trap and lift up into the trap. So they would come up like this into the trap. And on every single trap, they created a steam lock. Now, can you understand the frustration at the site? The operators would see the temperature, the viscosity was going down on the product transport. And they would freak out because, you know, you're having problems with the pumps or getting material flow. And then they would say the traps are blocked. And then people would go over and test the traps and the traps would be hot. Well, the traps aren't blocked. So everybody's scratching their head, what's going on? What had happened was because there wasn't an instruction to the contractor, they created the steam lock ahead of every single trap by looping. And it doesn't have to be that much. It only has to be this much distance to create a steam lock. If you elevate basically one tube diameter, you can create a steam lock. So you want to drain gravity down into, the, down into the trap. And I thought that really needs to be explained to everyone in an article that people can refer to that forever. And remember, don't do that. The third thing was actually the most serious one. There was a refinery somewhere in the same Gulf Coast area, and they had what would be uh, explained as a significant incident with a critical product transport. It wasn't using stuff that we, our traps or anything like that, but they had an incident where they had a freeze up, and if they had another freeze up, it would shut the refinery down. So they decided to use the existing product and put that to a test and use other system and see what would be better in a kind of side-by-side -side comparison. And they did the test with the other original company and they came back to us and said, the goal is can you beat getting this sampling up to 300 degrees Fahrenheit in 30 hours? So in concert with our local collaborators at Control Southeast using their enhanced tube tracing system and TLV free flow traps, uh, this refinery sent critical people there to evaluate the process. Uh, everything was thermal coupled and things like that. And we didn't get 300 degrees in 30 hours. No, we got 320 degrees in 12 hours. And I thought people should understand that if you apply, apply the proper thermal maintenance system for conductive heat transfer, and if you use the right trapping technology, you don't have to have an expectation of 300 degrees in 30 hours. You can have an expectation of 320 degrees in 12 hours. The difference can be that significant. So I thought that should be put into an article for all posterity. For those of you that have stayed with us this long, we really love talking about STEAM issues. Thank you so much for attending the webinar. And I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Norm. Back to you. Thanks, Jim. Well, th thank you, everybody, my collaborators again, and fellow STEAM lovers for uh, the Q&A review, and, and Jim, thanks for reviewing all the things that, that you've seen that inspired you to put this article together and this presentation together. So with that, that concludes today's presentation. I want to thank you all for tuning in and uh, joining us today. And again, please uh, join us next Friday, where Jim will review uh, water hammer and condensate return systems at 11 o'clock, uh, go to tlv.com to register for that event. Thanks for joining us. Goodbye. Bye-bye.